Hello and welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me in another of my wonderful interviews. Now, as you know, on this channel, we've been talking about the stuff they've been doing in the sky. Have you looked up? Have you seen it? Of course you have. You know what's going on. And we feel pretty impotent about doing something about it. Well, I want to find out more. And so I was reached out by a couple of lo very lovely chaps who I've been talking to behind the scenes for a couple of weeks. These are pilots. Now, they want to keep their identity naturally uh, hidden uh, for obvious reasons. They work within the industry and they know what's going on, but they are prepared to speak. And this is a chance for you and I to find out a little more about the real murky world of the chemtrails, the climate engineering, the, the, the stuff they're doing in the skies. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm only going to give you their first names and we've also digitized their voices and if it's not digitized enough you may find that even my voice has been digitized in order to protect their identity so I hope you'll bear with us so first of all I'd like to introduce Eve hello Eve yes uh, good evening uh, my name is Eves I am a commercial pilot I have been for just over 25 years uh, I flew 10 years in freight and then uh, the rest of 15 years on business jets and so I have uh, extensively travelled all around Europe, uh, America, Canada, the Middle East and uh, as far as Singapore and I'm based in Frankfurt and my original country is Belgium. Thank you very much Eves. and uh, the second pilot who we're going to talk to is Russ. Hello Russ. Hello Richard, uh, thanks for having us on your show. I'm Russ. I've had a lifetime in aviation, starting off firstly in the military, then I moved on to commercial flights, which include passengers and cargo, and currently I'm working in the private sector, uh, both the UK and into Europe. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for joining me. This is uh, a great privilege of my, myself, and it's going to be fascinating for the audience to find out exactly what is going on. As I said at the beginning, we're all aware now, I think, and, and a lot of people are waking up to the fact that the skies are not what they were perhaps, I don't know, 40 years ago. Maybe they've been doing it a long time, but we've certainly seen a huge amount of this spraying. We want, I'd like to find out from you both, A, what it is they're doing, what they're spraying, and if you have any idea about who's doing it, why they're doing it, and what the... Uh, what the motive is. Um, these are some of the questions. And of course, finally, what we can do to put an end to this, because if we're all breathing in whatever is being sprayed, that potentially is damaging our health. And that's not a good thing for anybody, especially as none of us has asked them to do that, as far as I know. Um, so who would like to kick off with um, what, they're, what, what they're spraying and, and perhaps why? Uh, yes, I can answer that, uh, Richards. Um, so what they're spraying, uh, we've uh, all around Europe, we have had uh, tests done from the dust on your car, from the dust on roofs. And uh, I've noticed the chemtrails personally for about the last 10 years. Uh, so they have been tested. Uh, if you go all to a website that I'll give you initially, it is uh, geoengineeringwatch.org. That's geoengineeringwatch.org. Uh, a lot of uh, confirming information can also be found on that website. So we have had many samples tested uh, from various laboratories where they have um, mass spectrometers. And the main constituents are barium, strontium, aluminium oxide. Uh, the first two are carcinogenic. Aluminium oxide promotes Alzheimer's disease, amongst other things. And uh, there are various microplastics, uh, up to 2% uranium, and uh, graphene oxide, which we all know about. Uh, these tend to be the basic elements in what they're spraying. The justification for it, um, they say, and we're talking the New World Order, globalists, etc, etc, is to dim the sun because it's climate change or whatever they want to call it next week, 
uh, is to dim the sun and to insidiously poison everything. Uh, it is the depopulation program. It all leads back to that. It leads back to the World Health Organization. It leads back to the uh, WEF, the uh, WEF at Davos. And the main players who are sponsoring this uh, are the Bill Gates Foundation and various others. But this is in the Agenda 2030, uh, is it in the Agenda 2021. It's uh, well documented in the John Hopkins University um, agendas. Uh, they are all publicly available. So it, uh, it essentially does two things. It is to block out the sun and to uh, insidiously poison everything. And just by blocking out the sun, of course, you're, you're actually depleting the amount of vitamin D that uh, people can receive and also, of course, pro prohibiting plants um, from growing. And if not plants, then animals and consequently humans. Uh, precisely. And uh, yes, it's the, um, yeah, it, it, the, the animals are eating the grass. Uh, it's in the grass. We've been speaking to a lot of farmers. Um, as I say, I'm from Belgium and a lot of the farmers there are reporting all sorts of problems with animals, uh, particularly newborn animals such as lambs. And uh, yes, it, it's starting to affect everything and it is insidious. And of course, your doctor, when you go to, you have something wrong, they have no idea where it's from. Yes. And this has been going, we know, from at least the 1940s, but I've had reports that, that, that hot air balloons were sort of mucking about with weather testing in the 1880s or something. Yes, uh, also it's in the public domain if, if people search for this. Uh, there are hundreds of geoengineering patents have been applied for by a variety of companies from around the world. And again, if, uh, it takes a bit of research, but if you do the research, you'll find that the main sponsors for a lot of these companies all go back to the same sources, uh, which is uh, some of the Soros foundations, uh, the Bill Gates foundations, and so on. Um, it gets a little bit more involved because uh, with a lot of the metal particulates in what they're spraying, uh, both at around about 10 to 15,000 feet, uh, the higher level uh, altitude um, spray that they're doing is uh, mainly contaminants in the fuel. Uh, we dismissed that to begin with because we thought the hot section of the engine will just melt everything. But in actual fact, what they're putting into the fuel uh, it has a higher melting point of around about 900 degrees. And hot engines, uh, hot sections of the engines tend to burn at around seven to 800 degrees. So, but much of these spray uh, applications that you can see aircraft doing uh, actually doesn't go through the fuel. Some of it's in the fuel, a very small amount, but a lot of it is actually external nozzles. Um, so HARP, uh, which I think everybody has now heard about, uh, there are various sites around the world. Uh, this is high frequency, but it's they're using thousands of watts. So it does affect the ionosphere and having the metal particulates in the uh, ionosphere already, uh, they can then cause uh, different pressure or heat domes, as they call it, which then manipulates the jet stream, which then picks up more water as it has a longer sea track. And then when they collapse the heat dome, the jet stream then comes over the UK, over Northern Europe, and we have two to three times the normal rainfall. This is all done by design. When people look up and they see the aircraft flying overhead, the immediate thought, I suppose, to many who are awake to what's going on is that these have been either fitted covertly or with the pilot's knowledge to normal commercial flights. Is that the case or are these special aeroplanes doing this? Uh, it's a mixture of both, actually. Uh, the initial culprits were freighter aircraft that have been converted. Um, we've done a lot of research into this in, in Europe and we're finding there's a company who supply uh, freighter aircraft called ASL. Uh, they have actually supplied some of these companies 
sorry, some of these aircraft lease some of these aircraft to various companies around Europe, freighter companies who then apply for the conversions, which are fairly fairly simple to do. Uh, in the UK, there's a couple of companies that we've also been keeping an eye on. They um, very simply have either a roll-on, roll-off system, which is uh, containerized like a freighter, a freighter aircraft would normally have. So it's a pallet with a pump, wiring, a container with the chemicals in. Uh, they get loaded onto the aircraft, they get slotted into position, an engineer will connect them all up and uh, he'll get airborne. The other aircraft have uh, permanent tanks already fitted and again, they're, they're deliberately and willfully fitted. So the CAA in each country have approved these systems, so the CAA know about what they're doing. We've also looked into the company's air operators certificates and some of these companies have more than one. And some of them, for instance, are allowed to spray their oil spill response. Uh, they, their legitimacy is that they can spray detergents over, low level over the sea onto an oil slick. But in actual fact, when you think, well, how many oil slicks were there around Europe or around the world in the last 20 years, uh, it's been minimal. So that raised my suspicion. That's how I got onto this many years ago. The AOC also says that some of these operators can spray pesticides over wooded areas. And clearly that's uh, in violation of the AOC because they're, they're main, most cities don't have wooded areas. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's been going on for quite some time. It's just that we're now starting to notice. So let me bring um, Russ on, if I may. Russ, um, where I am, down on the south coast near Brighton, um, we're clearly very close to Gatwick Airport, so we see a lot of uh, planes going overhead. Some days more than others are obviously spraying. Some have your contrails, and you can easily tell the difference. How many planes, um, Russ, are operating this, and are they operating over... Let's just take Great Britain. I'm sure they're operating across the rest of the world with other contracts, etc. But how many operating uh, planes are operating in any one time? Well, it's very difficult to know the exact numbers, Richard. But through our investigation, it's clear that they tend to operate in a, a set pattern. That set pattern, you have to understand, is all controlled by international as well as the UK um, air traffic service. We also know that the they are talking to the military operators. The National Air Traffic Service, NATS as it's called, um, both military and civil operators actually sit side by side in one control room. What happens is a flight plan would be filed. They would then have the if you like, the prior knowledge of the routes of these aircraft are going to take, altitude, speed, direction, etc. And what we're finding, and this is very important for your viewers to understand, many people use the flight tracking apps, in particular Flight Radar 24. There are others out there, but it's been proven that these do not deliberately, they are being blocked from the customers being blocked from seeing the aircraft flying. That's why you can look out in the sky and physically see, you know, the big grid patterns building as these planes are flying non-commercial routes. They're not flying the normal patterns that anybody can get hold of an aviation um, route chart and have a look at where they should be. They're not following these flight paths but they're being controlled by both military and civil controllers. What they're doing is they obviously can see the aircraft for safety reasons and to keep them, you know, get them through. But the problem is that the, the apps won't let Joe Public see them. So that's why you'll see one with a trail, maybe three or four, and they tend to come through in sort of half a dozen, like a squadron at a time, coming through in waves building these patterns, particularly in front of the sun. The more you witness this, you'll realise that's their aim. 
with the, what they call the solar radiation management. And then within a few minutes to a few hours, you'll see the sky just cloud over. And if you don't get the rain, you're lucky. But it, that's why we're suffering with this lack of vitamin D, amongst other things. So the aircraft are being hidden from view from these tracking apps. The other thing to point out is that internationally, there's a system called QRA. That's Quick Reaction Alert. Uh, through NATO, it's called the NATO Air Policing System, and in America, it's called NORAD. The idea of that is, is to defend countries from attack. So if an aircraft, for whatever reason, doesn't show on a radar system, or it's lost its radio contact with the controller, etc., they would then initiate QRA, which involves scrambling fighter jets, in the UK, that's Collinsby, Lincolnshire, and Lossy Mouth in Scotland, to literally get up there, find out what the aircraft's doing, because he's not talking to a controller, or he's not on a radar, or he's not following the track he should be doing, and they would then decide whether they need to intercept or whatever. So the important thing to remember is that these aircraft are coming through with prior permission because the RAF in the UK are not being scrambled to intercept. So that's how deep this whole thing goes. That shows the involvement, international airspace restrictions and control, as well as the CAA here in the UK. And they're doing it daily, you know, so so often. I mean, it, it, I, these days you, you never seem, seem to think these pilots get a day off or occasionally you get the odd day off and you think, oh... If only we knew what the rotor was like, the, the pilot's rotor was, we could uh, plan our holidays around them. Um, is it true, I spoke to Ian Simpson, who's uh, done a lot of research on this, and he was saying that they'll put one substance out, then another plane will put another substance out, and then in the air, the two substances come together, and a bit like araldite, the glue, one being the catalyst, will then create a... The, the third effect, as it were. Is that is that how these chemicals work? That appears to be exactly how they do it, particularly, as I previously mentioned, when you see half a dozen or more come through. The trails do seem to be of a different, shall we say, composition. And it, that's a very good description, just like aerodite. You mix the two together to get the end result. And then, of course, as uh, has been previously mentioned, if they want to then move the jet stream and change the weather system to attack, for example, a particular area of the country for, say, farming and make it extremely wet for a short period, or indeed the other way, make it extremely dry, then they'll fire up HARP or 5G or Doppler radar systems. That would manipulate the nanoparticles in those trails, and hence they can control the weather and the jet stream accordingly. Do we know when they switch on things like harp so that it starts to use the vibrational technology, whatever it is, to start doing that? Do we know, are we able to recognise, say, the pattern in the clouds that has been manipulated from the ground? Yes, indeed. It, there is a particular pattern which is, they call it mackerel sky. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to add a picture to the video, but... Uh, Mackerel sky is very, very fine ripples in the sky. They say, well, the meteorological term is that it's caused by frequency waves in the upper atmosphere. That is true. But the thing is, of course, if you want to do something covertly without people cottoning on to what you're doing, you're going to make it look as natural as possible. But there are time and time again examples of where they've sprayed and then they've manipulated everybody's witnessed and photographed and videoed this mackerel cloud and the mackerel cloud is confirmation that harp has been used or indeed 5g or doppler radar and i'm just looking now on on um just on ordinary google uh, images and we can see samples on on the line here of uh, mackerel sky yeah which is that's, rather... that's the give giveaway um, it's very difficult to obviously know if it is mackerel, genuinely natural mackerel, sorry, mackerel, or 
it's been hard to manipulate it, but again, it normally coincides just within a few hours of the strain occurring. Right, yeah. Um, let's go back to um, Eve's. Um, one of the things that uh, is particularly worrying is, of course, as, as you mentioned, the poisonous effect of this, that people are breathing this stuff in. Do you think the the companies that are doing this know that we're breathing this in, that it's affecting humans? Do you think they know that there is a bigger agenda behind it? Or do you think they just believe that they're working for the climate's sake to save the planet and radiate the sunlight back uh, into space? Uh, that's a good question. And it's one that uh, uh, I've come across many times before. Uh, the answer is maybe when they started out on this, they saw it as a business opportunity. Let's not ask too many questions. Um, in short answer to that question, I would say yes, they uh, fully realize what they're doing. Uh, anybody, once you've found out the constituent parts of what you're spraying, anybody can then look it up. You can Google it if you have to. And you can find out what the net effect of these chemicals will have on uh, mankind, human life, uh, plant life, and so on. Um, the, the pilots, the other tangential to that question, I would say the other question I get asked is, do the pilots know what they're doing? Yes, they do, 100%. Um, if you have dangerous goods on board, which these chemicals will be classed as dangerous goods, the captain has to have something called a NOTOC, which is a notice to captain. And that will list where the dangerous goods are. This is very common with freight aircraft. So um, you, a freight aircraft can have a, a thousand different uh, manufactured goods on, but then he may be taking radioisotopes for an x-ray machine. Now, that's dangerous goods. They have to be handled and they have to be packaged uh, to a minimum requirement. And there may be certain parts or, of the aircraft that it's not allowed in and, and so on. So if the, air, the idea behind this is if uh, an aircraft has to divert due to an emergency, um, then the captain runs off the aircraft with the NOTOC and he says to the fire chief, yes, I have radioisotopes on board and they're in that section of the aircraft. Um, that's what it's all about. The, yeah, they, they will know. Uh, they, they will know. Plus the fact, to take that a little further, we found out that uh, in Europe, about two-thirds of the chemicals come from America and about a third of the chemicals come from India. And uh, there are various companies bringing them in. Uh, the military, we also believe, are bringing them in. As I said before, I'm from Belgium. And uh, there's a base there, Zutendal, and they've been operating, the military have been spraying for quite some time. In fact, the military have been spraying a lot longer than the civil operators. Civil operators have probably been in the last 20 years, and they've upped it in the last four to five. Uh, but the military before that, yeah, the pilots know what they're spraying. Not only the pilots then, but presumably the rest of the the people involved, the ground crew that would be loading the chemicals, the manufacturers of the chemicals must have an inkling of where this stuff is going. Um, all the people associated with uh, the, the, the app and um, the military themselves, they must surely be aware that they are breathing this stuff in, in an everyday way, you know, not necessarily at work, but, but sitting in their garden on a day off going, oh, they're up above, they must have an inkling that they are slowly poisoning themselves, haven't they? Uh, excellent question, yes. Um, you would have thought that people would uh, have worked that out by now. <laughs> the access to, well, the whole system is very cleverly designed. Um, a lot of these freight companies, particularly the dedicated ones who are just spraying us and, and not taking freight, they uh, have a very strict code, uh, standard operating procedures. You'll find that a lot of these pilots are ex-military, so they would have signed their, their country's Official Secrets Act. They know how to keep their mouths shut. 
The engineers that work on these aeroplanes typically are ex-military. Again, the same rules apply. The suppliers of the chemicals, um, yeah, uh, their, their chemicals are used for whatever. Uh, they probably don't ask too many questions. Uh, the people that mix them, yes, they will know for sure, uh, but there'll be very few. Very, mm. And again, they'll be under very strict contracts of uh, non-disclosure agreements and so on. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's very well organised, but the amount of people doing the handling will be minimum. What they have, what we have noticed, is that the point of entry for a lot of these chemicals tend to be uh, larger airfields because they're being brought in by seven four sevens or heavy military jets. They are then distributed to smaller airfields, presumably by road. Um, airfields, I'm going to mention a couple of in the UK, for instance, uh, Cardiff is a good one because the public really can't see anything of the airfield. They've got some hangarage there where if any aircraft are between the hangars, again, the public can't see this. So it's ideal for these operators to use these type of airfields where they, can, um, where they can't be seen. And these people who are doing this and handling this, you know, on the lower sort of ranks, presumably they also have wives and children that they must be aware they're also poisoning. I mean, it does seem crazy that uh, that these people, but maybe these people have been selected that they don't have any family or don't give a monkeys about their family and their mothers and fathers and so on. Um, okay. it, despite the fact that it may be a small number. Yeah, it's a bit of a mixture, Richard. I mean, I, I fly uh, business jets, so I've been to many, many different airfields in the UK and all around Europe. And talking to a lot of the ground handling agents, uh, some of whom obviously will deal with these chemicals, um, the, the amount of people that are allowed to deal with them will be absolute minimal. Uh, they are being told not to ask questions and just to get on with their job. And the usual threat is that they would be sacked uh, if, has, if they do get involved or they want to ask too many questions. That, that that's standard, seems to be standard. But I, what has shocked me is the amount of people that are working at the airports that uh, just don't to, seem to be aware of their environment. Um, typically, I saw uh, a very unusual aircraft uh, which was out of base. It was a Delta aircraft and uh, it was at Manchester Airport. Now, Delta, I know, do not fly into Manchester. And it was an Airbus A330. And I know full well, uh, as many people do, that there is a an Airbus going around with the Delta livery and it's got Delta written underneath it and uh, with an American registration. Uh, we don't believe it's actually being operated by Delta, uh, but it was at Manchester and it was out of place. They don't fly there. And of course, the excuse is given that, oh, yes, it was a medical emergency and he'd, it was a diversion, a long haul diversion. So the crew were in the hotel. Um, people need to learn to question things. And one of the things that uh, I know, well, <laughs> we, we know many people who are now starting to inquire about this it's difficult because uh, the the intelligence that we need is people who work at airports air traffic controllers uh, we need them to speak up we know they, their jobs have been threatened i've spoken to one or two air traffic controllers and they've said yeah we can't talk about certain things and they won't because they're so scared of losing their jobs but we do need more registrations. We do need them to start speaking up. Um, the amount of people, as I said before, who deal with these particular packages, these chemicals are absolutely minimum. I think they just blindly do their job, which is very sad. Uh, but mm. yes, you're right, they're breathing them in. How can the public, if they wanted to get in to gather evidence, help? gather that evidence if they went to airports would they see could they if they had certain knowledge what would they need to know i mean you mentioned about delta and it went through my mind of course the the idea of these uh, medical emergencies what with people dropping down dead every 10 minutes thanks to a a certain um, medical intervention that we've all been dropped we can see how 
that and the advent of a potential bird flu or these sort of other narratives that are being thrust at us could disguise the aeroplane's uh, routes and delivery patterns. But could, if is there information that the public can can do relatively easily to f um, expose or gather the evidence so that this can be highlighted um, later on? Uh, yes, there's a lot of things they can do. So, number one, now you know about it, please be more attentive. Uh, we, we know that the aircraft that are physically spraying uh, over the land are between 10 and 15,000 feet. They tend to fly quite slowly and they're not on your flight radar apps. So if you have anybody with a good camera or a good, good uh, camera phone or indeed a telephoto lens, uh, somebody who's a photographer, uh, photographs of these aircraft with location, time, date, distance, uh, sorry, not distance, the direction that they're flying. Uh, when they go to the airports, anything unusual, unusual equipment. Um, for instance, uh, some of these freighters are out of place. The key thing is somebody must know somebody who works at an airport. That's really key. And what we're going to do is we're just asking anybody that works at an airport, it's your next door neighbor, it's your friend down the road, um, ask them. Now there's a little trick that they can do. As I said, don't tell me, just write it down. So if they get a registration of an aircraft or something like this, this it's just to be more attentive. The other thing we would say is over sea, over the sea, they're spraying the sea as well. We know this. Uh, they tend to drop down to around about 5,000 feet. And uh, we've noticed uh, various places, particularly the Pacific Ocean. Uh, you can actually see the chemtrails with, with some of the uh, live uh, satellite feeds that you can get. Uh, we also know that uh, they've been spraying uh, over the stretch of water between, uh, I think it's Cornwall and Devon, I think it is, and the uh, South Wales coast at 5,000 feet. So fishermen. Farmers, everybody, yes, just pay more attention, photographs, and there's plenty of websites out there now um, that you can actually go and post these on. One of the things I suggested, um, and I've yet to compile it because I haven't really got a, enough good ones to put on the show, unfortunately, because it all takes a bit of time, would be time-lapse photography, um, getting a camera, setting it up, and then over a period of hour, hours, or even an hour or so show how the the aeroplanes have come into the sky and then watch the formation of the clouds to prove exactly what's happening. Um, if lots of people were doing that and posting those images so that more people could see the the impact of that, would that help? Uh, yes, it would uh, greatly, particularly if there's a timestamp on the uh, on the video. Yes, absolutely. Um, Let's go back to uh, Russ. Um, one of the things that has been given to me as a as an alternative solution or suggestion, rather, is that what we're seeing is the uh, the amount of pollution over the last what should we say eighty, ninety, hundred years since planes have been flying that it's actually the fact that it's the whatever the uh, the aeroplane fuel is diesel, petrol, whatever it is, and it's the accumulation of that up in the atmosphere. Is that is that even possible, or is that complete nonsense? Well, it is possible, but what we've got to realise, Richard, and everybody's got to realise, since COVID and the way everybody was, let's face it, duped in many, many ways, and to this day they're still trying Project Fear, the ramping up of the geoengineering has surpassed anything else that's been done. Yes, the percentage of what's in the sky is genuine contrails, but now I would say it's definitely more like 96, 97, maybe even 98% of the lines you're seeing in the sky is this poison. Um, you know, and just to go back to what we were saying previously, the brilliant Dane Wigginton on geoengineeringwatch.org. He has a YouTube channel and he does a weekly update, normally comes through to, I think the UK gets it on a Sunday. 
and he does an hour-long update of news from around the world regarding geoengineering that, of course, the mainstream aren't reporting on. Now, if we go back to the recent Dubai cloud seeding fiasco, that was nothing new to people like us that know, because, in fact, they overcooked that, and that's what created them disastrous floods that everybody knew. It was so bad that mainstream couldn't avoid reporting it. That was actually done again. It was actually done previous to that in November of last year. And there are there is a video that's available on YouTube if you used to type in Dubai floods November of the desert under six foot of water with um, camels trying to actually have to swim to survive. Um, what they're doing, they're also, like they did with COVID in a particular way, they're saying to people, it's not what you're seeing. You're not seeing it. Don't believe your own eyes, which of course is a quote from 1984, George Orwell. You know, their, their final command is, you know, you do not believe your own eyes or ears. Well, we can all see what's going on. And with the cloud seeding, what they're now trying to do is to make everybody think that it's just cloud seeding and not poison. We have to, right. we have to stress it is a poison. Yes, cloud seeding is part of geoengineering, but that's normally achieved with just a twin-engine propeller-driven aircraft which fires some silver into the clouds to make it rain or stop it rain. When you get it wrong, you get what happened in Dubai. But mm. of course, the problem here is the poison, as we've mentioned. For example, the aluminium, when it gets into the soil, it kills all plant life from the roots up. Yes. Also, it's been proven, again, if we quote geoengineering.org, 10 years ago, it was already being seen that bee populations were suffering. And it's even been reported to us here in the UK now that um, bees are being witnessed flying around plants in people's gardens, and people are saying, "Well, that's behaving oddly." And the bee is the bees have been proven to have so much aluminium building up in their system that then they're getting get a form of uh, Alzheimer's disease, and they're not even flying around naturally anymore. Yes, that's been dying off in thousands. And of course, if the bees die and the crops die which is part of the plan and the overall agenda that's where you're getting your food supply problems from that's the great famine yeah this is how it's all connected richard the mps say and people have sent me um freedom of information requests or they've they've been in touch with their mps and said you know we know what's going on. The MPs keep saying, no, this is part of the... If it's happening at all, they'll come out with the same story that it is to dim the sky, to radiate, to save the planet, um, and all of that, um, which may well, you know, as we've discussed, is is part of the story, or is the cover story, literally a cover story. Um, however, none of us have been asked to have our consent to this, They've just done it anyway. Surely there ought to be in the manifestos, particularly now with the uh, the next election. Do you think it would be, and I, I did make a video on this, that the MPs should be asked if they are going to be doing this and continuing to do this, if they want our vote. And if they are going to do it, perhaps we should be saying, well, I'm not going to vote for you because I've not consented to have anything sprayed in the sky, no matter what it is. It's going to come down at some point and we're going to breathe it in. Do you think uh, blitzing MPs and potential MPs and all these candidates getting in is, is a sensible suggestion to get them to promise to campaign against it or to, to say that people don't want it? I think if I can jump in here, I think that's uh, an excellent idea. Uh, it, I know that the people have actually been uh, serving notices on their MPs uh, along those lines. Uh, the MPs are just like to establish these, uh, it's the same um, pretty much for the UK and around Europe. A uh, standard letter comes back and the MPs will, no, will not go back to the foundations, which is the 
Paris Climate Accord in 2015, uh, which all member states signed a, an agreement saying that this is what the, they would go ahead and do, undertake the uh, geoengineering. Uh, none of us, none of us had a say in that. Uh, but the MP will find some comfort under the uh, false legitimacy of this Paris Climate Accord. Now, the Paris Climate Accord is totally based on fraud. You won't get the MPs to go beyond that. They'll say, no, everything we're doing is in accordance with, in accordance with. Um, so the fact is, we know that it's based on fraud because we know the CO2 levels, they've lied about it. We know all that. To go to your MP and say, uh, where, what would you do? What is your take on this? That is a very, very searching question. And uh, I think when MPs realise now that if they are in any way going to support this, they're not going to get a vote, they have a choice. They either genuinely change their minds about something and campaign actively against it. And I think you'll find a lot of MPs won't because I think a lot of them have, uh, we found that have been um, either, I've uh, got to say this carefully, um, there, there's been inducements and um, they're paid for. However, that inducement has been, uh, they're, they're paid for. So that effectively will be the end of their career. So they're actually driving themselves into a, a hard corner uh, and it's organic. Uh, but people should be asking their MPs that, that, that precise question, yes. I mean, presumably once they've been put on notice and they've been told this is what's going on and here is the, the evidence as we can present it, um, if they are complicit with that, uh, that is the complicit, that they are then complicit to effectively, and I don't like to say this, but murder. Uh, accessory after the fact, yes. Um, the, I think a lot of people, uh, including myself, gave our local MPs the benefit of the doubt. Um, I certainly did about five years ago, and that's called, uh, if they were trying to do something and it's gone wrong, but it was done in innocence, that's misfeasance. Uh, this is the Black's Law Dictionary now. Uh, malfeasance is when they know they're doing something wrong, or, they can, or they've been told they've been doing something wrong with evidence, and they continue to do it. It's now willful, it's malicious, that's malfeasance in public office. That's a very serious offence. And those people who are in the cabinets of our various governments, that is treason. And that's where international law and the law of war manual comes in. And uh, it doesn't matter what agreements these companies have got with the government saying that they cannot be sued or they cannot be uh, pursued. Uh, they are invalid because everything is based on fraud and uh, the, there are ongoing military tribunals. And it's only a matter of time, I believe, before that they will catch up with these people. But in the meantime, uh, yes, we serve notice with evidence uh, on to our every MP every MP in every country. So certainly my viewers who are on the whole quite active and quite uh, uh, keen to get involved in this sort of thing in terms of writing to MPs or, or to anybody else, even, the, even the, um, the companies that are doing this to show their disapproval or to show their anger in an honourable way on paper to say, we know what you're doing and we're putting you on notice. Um, that they, they could certainly get their pens warmed up, as it were, to uh, get in touch and show the evidence. And you've pointed to uh, Dane Wigington's site at geoengineeringwatch.org, which is as, as a good site. Um, we, I know, again, I'm referencing Ian Simpson because I've had him on the show fairly recently. I've also had Dane on the show a couple of times. Ian's take was that we would have to have a some form of legal case to make this into a precedent. Um, I, I'm not 100% clear how you would do that, um, but do you think that is a way of stopping this that nobody actually wants or nobody's asked for, or is there a better way? Um, that, that is a way. It is an option for us. The only issues that we, we have discussed this at length and by the way, I uh, just want to say at this point that um, we're not lone soldiers. 
fortunately, um, there are more and more people waking up in the aviation industry. Um, I know personally now four, five, six pilots in the UK that are very active. I know about 15 in Germany that are very active. I know five in Belgium that are active. So there are more and more people now getting aware of this. Um, to answer the question, the legal system, as it stands at the moment, is incredibly corrupt for the reasons that we know and we mentioned before. Uh, to get a case, to uh, mount a case, would be fairly costly. Uh, it will be rigorously defended uh, by lawyers who are on the wrong side of the fence and judges that are on the wrong side of the fence. And that would be very consuming as far as the cost is concerned and also very consuming time-wise. And I would suggest it's time that, that we don't have. So the, the, we still continue down that road. Yes, I think it's merit worthy. The other thing is to record everything. And there are two ways you can do this to send to the ICC, the International um, Court of The Hague. And also there is the Inspector General of the US Air Force. And if you go online and look up Inspector General US Air Force, you will find um, a, a section there to report corrupt persons. And you can register your details. So that's with the US Air Force, Inspector General. The reason why I mention this is because there are ongoing military tribunals. And they are all over. They're not just Guantanamo Bay, they're in Diego Garcia, um, they're on several aircraft carriers and so on. They are going through a very long list uh, of indictments that have been ongoing since, I believe, uh, 2019. Uh, once they've, they've almost gone through all of them, and they are estimating uh, eight and a half million further indictments for, shall we say, middle and lower management. And this will be everybody that has been proven to be uh, conducting operations which are considered crimes against humanity. And chemical spraying of people is crimes against humanity. No two ways about it. And um, we see this daily, every time we get airborne, uh, almost every day, we see them in the sky. And I have a, a, a trick where I switch off my air conditioning. Uh, you have to do it very carefully because the pressure on the ears. Uh, but I will not have any of the air conditioning working as we're flying through the levels where these chemtrails are in. And as I say, they're generally between ten and 15,000 feet. What does it look like, just as a matter of interest? I haven't been in an aeroplane for some time. Uh, what does it look like when you're flying above these trails being laid? We, we see them from the ground and they look uh, like lines. Are, do they have height, these things, as, as the various weight of the, the particulates drop to make it into more like a, um, a vertical ribbon? Yeah, so as you, you get different perspectives as you're taking off or as you're coming into land. So uh, taking off, yes, you, you can see that you normally burst through a cloud layer and yes, there they are. Uh, so I do my best to avoid them. And uh, if we've been given a heading to steer, then uh, I'll, if it's going to take me right through one, I will ask air traffic if I have the time to uh, 10 degrees left, 10 degrees right to avoid. Um, they normally grant me this unless you're in busy airspace like Frankfurt, and then the standard instrument departure is the departure because there's so many other airplanes around, so you can't always avoid them. From above, you get a better perspective, uh, providing there's no intermediate cloud layers. And yes, you can see the, the, the extensive way they're um, flying them. You can't see them, uh, you can't see the particulates because a lot of them are nano uh, mm. as well as micro. Uh, but you can see where previous ones were and the, how they've spread out, certainly, yeah. But you get a better perspective when you're above them. I, I assume that somewhere online um, there are photographs from above to, to show it. And, and that sort of thing would be quite useful, I suppose, if anybody's going on holiday or in, in an aircraft and can take pictures of like that, just to give us a different perspective. Because I think when you're on the ground, they can seem, perhaps to the ordinary layman, innocuous. 
but uh, once you know what they are, um, and I'm just looking at that picture that's next to me at this very moment, I mean, the amount of stuff that's in the sky there, and you know then it's all these heavy metals which should not be anywhere near our lungs and in our bodies, it's, uh, it's incredibly scary. But to the, to the layman um, who is unsure about all of this, it, uh, it, they're still thinking, oh, it's just, uh, you know, it's just that contrail's gone mad or something. Um, but from above... It, 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 do you get a feeling that they're bigger, thicker, deeper, more c complex? Yes. Um, yeah, they're, they're very intensive. Not nine times out of ten, they're very intensive. Uh, they're also, depending on the aircraft and the fit that they have, the method by which they can spray these chemicals, you can actually um, determine, I think, um, there's an operator using a 727, and that's got a big boom at the back. Uh, that's very distinctive because that leaves a very wide stripe. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, I don't know what else to say about it. it, it, it we, we can spot them a mile off. It's a good mm. idea for uh, any holiday makers. Uh, if they see them, yes, let's have a video. Uh, the window that you're sitting next to tends to be very limited on your angle. Um, uh, I've taken videos from the cockpit now and uh, of aircraft um, uh, below chemtrailing and they have been posted online what do you think uh, we're, we're sort of running out of time now what do you think the outcome is to prevent this and to stop it and um, how long do you think we have before the effects of this have really ramped up so much uh, i mean it's so difficult now to tell what's making people ill because we live in so much poison with the uh, EMFs of our um, business world and home world with uh, 5G or the normal 4G and all of that going on, a certain chemical that's been injected into people because they were frightened of a, a certain virus, and now water pollution that we know is happening, and, and the skies. I mean, everything is, is against us. But do you think that, and we've seen this this particular, the, the, from the winter till this point, it still feels like winter because the temperature drops as soon as they, those clouds come over by several degrees, which is extremely noticeable. There's no warmth in the atmosphere that you would normally get, uh, which does seem to be characteristic of it. Um, is there a positive outcome? Either of yeah. Russ or, or Eve. Uh, I'll, I'll let Russ answer that one first. Definitely a positive outcome. If we can all get together to save humanity by just looking up at the sky, taking the pictures, taking the video that we've already discussed, making people aware that what they were, you know, what they used to see in the sky when they were younger is no longer there. Where's your blue sky? Where's your sunshine? Why does it sometimes when it's cloudy, when you go outside, it smells, you can smell the atmosphere. You know something's not right. Mm. Just get people to look up, question things. The more we get people that are awake and spread this knowledge, then we can defeat it. I can't give you a time scale, but we will pre prevail. I promise you that. Uh, yeah, I'd like to add to that. Uh, I totally agree with what Russ is saying. And let's not forget, um, we, we have been enslaved, definitely been enslaved with everything, taxes and everything, and the whole system is changing. Um, just on a bit of a spiritual side, we've, we have God-given rights, and no man has any right to take those rights away. No one. Uh, so we, it needs to be, it will be defeated. It will be defeated. And the earth uh, and nature does have a wonderful way of recovery. Um, it's, it's historically, uh, that's always been the case. Uh, so we do need everybody to be vigilant. Put in what you can. Facebook has been uh, actually exploded with people's posts and so on, but equally, sadly, uh, there are these uh, shields out there that are obviously hired guns to spread disinformation. They're very clever in the way they can do it. It can be very subtle. 
and uh, they're just there to make you angry and um, hopefully dissuade you from uh, continuing. No, we need to march through this and so we need any bits of information. Never think that any information that you have might be too small for anybody because it's nine times out of ten it's the missing piece that we need. On a final note, I've got to ask you, because people have been talking about this uh, for a long time now, or it seems the last few weeks, and it's become a bit trendy and a bit, a bit, I don't know, left of field. Uh, organic white vinegar, the fumes of that, does that make any blind bit of difference? Or is that just hopium? I have not tested it, um, so I can't really answer that one, I'm afraid, Richard. Have yeah. you tried it, Russ? No, not at all. I've obviously seen the posts and had conversations, but we've got no evidence that there's anything in it. But why not try it if it makes you feel better? And if you get the proof it works, then great. Shout about it from the rooftops. Absolutely. If anything, you know, do give it a whirl. Uh, listen, gentlemen, it's been an absolute joy and um, very, very fascinating for me and the listeners uh, watching today. Thank you so much for your time and uh, raising your heads above the parapet, albeit somewhat disguised as, as best we can. Uh, please continue to do what you're doing and reporting and um, getting the message out. And of course, we will do our best on this channel to continue to talk about this subject, which is, um, as you say, it's growing. I mean, people are beginning to look up and they're beginning to take notice and the next government in this country at the election on the 4th of July uh, maybe should be thinking very closely if they want to keep their seats or stay in government, um, particularly as you were saying about the military trials, whether they want to uh, even uh, stay free people uh, about they should be concerning themselves with one of these biggest issues and that is the poisoning of the skies and the air that we breathe as well as the food that we eat. So I just want to say a big thank you for coming on and very much appreciate it. You're very welcome and uh, yeah, I just encourage all your listeners just to uh, to continue what you're doing and just uh, do your own research. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks very much indeed Richard and uh, we will prevail. Thank you so much. Well there we are, that's uh, Eves and Russ, uh, pilots, they're telling us what they know and, and how they've been uh, watching this over the last X many years, 10 years or more. And uh, it's now up to us to continue their work by doing the best we can, making this as obvious as possible so that there is no option but to stop. I'll be back with more monologues and more wonderful guests. But in the meantime, thank you for watching. Till next time, from us all, goodbye. <laughs> Sei sotto un cielo sbagliato